Okay, uh, let's look at John chapter 5. You got that? Verses 39 and 40. Remember, this was Jesus in one of his sessions where he scolded the Pharisees when he said to them, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. In other words, by remember the Pharisees memorized the Old Testament, thinking that would sort of get them a leg up with, with God. You think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. The clear contrast there. That you don't get life by how seriously you study the scriptures, memorize the scriptures, but they are God's means to point us to him who is the way, the truth, and the life. And so we've just read from this passage, a passage that speaks to what we talk about, what we mention every Sunday when we gather about the significance of this book we study. We just read what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us to begin to get a picture tonight of the prophets and their role in his revelation of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Please be seated. There are uh, 17 books that comprise what we call the, the section of prophecy in Scripture. And they make up one-fourth of the Scripture. That's pretty significant. And we need to understand them if we're going to need to put the history of the Bible in context and, and be schooled on the theology of the Bible. I would remind you that when the New Testament evangelists preached the gospel, they preached it from the Old Testament. They preached it from these prophetic books. This was, as one fellow said, this was their manual of evangelism. But it's interesting how people don't seem to know about the prophets. They don't know the message of the prophets. Uh, then perhaps, even though it's a fourth of Scripture, more than any other section of the Scripture, than, other than perhaps the apocalyptic literature. And the sad thing is with the apocalyptic literature, like Daniel and Revelation, people pretend to know more than they actually know. But in this section, they just they don't know a lot. It is, uh, by its designation, it's the second division of the Hebrew Bible. It was spoken of as the former prophets, you may not know this, and, and the latter prophets. The former prophets, however, uh, were actually the historical books. What we studied through is the historical books, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings. These books, of course, we've gone through these. They chronicled uh, God's dealings with his nation uh, under, uh, under a king appointed by him from the time of Joshua to the Babylonian captivity. And these, if you want to call them former prophets or, the, or these historical books, they give us uh, background, historical background to the actual prophetic writings. You'll remember that we had a... Uh, We had a chart we produced that showed you a timeline of the kings and within them the different prophets preaching. Thank you, buddy. I, I don't need it, but I appreciate you bringing it, okay? Thank you. I had some help back there. Somebody brought me my satchel. So it's good to know people are looking after me. I, I always appreciate that. The latter prophets now, which you and I would recognize as prophets, are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, and uh, the 12 minor prophets. And uh, they're called latter, not because they come closer to the end of the Old Testament. That's not it. Uh, and it's, and it's, and it's, I'm, it is because they come to the end of the Old not because of their chronology, but because they are close to the end of the Old Testament. Okay? And we have, we have what we call the written prophets, written records, and then the, the, the non-writing prophets. And I want to identify these for you. Uh, these people we know as prophets in the Old Testament uh, by their, what they had to say and what their de Nathan was designated. Ahijah, Edu, Jehu, Elijah, Elisha, Oded, uh, Shemaiah, Azariah, Hanani, Jehaziel, Hulda. These are, these are all designated as prophets in the Old Testament, and, uh, but they were non-writing prophets, so we don't know a lot about them. They don't have books in the Bible. Uh, with their names attached to them. 
Then when you get in more into the, uh, to the what's called the, the light, latter prophets or the writing prophets, uh, they're divided into two forms, major prophets and minor prophets. Again, not because of the importance, one's message is more important than the other, but because basically the size of them. Uh, Isaiah, which we're going to be looking at, 66 chapters. It's massive. We may take it up in two portions, uh, Isaiah 1 through 39, Isaiah 40 through 66. Uh, the message shifts considerably from judgment to hope in that, in that uh, prophecy. So uh, that's kind of how you, how you designate them, all right? As far as the characteristics of the, of the prophets generally, uh, they were called prophets, seers, watchmen, men of God, messengers, servants of the Lord. And if you could read Hebrew, the most prominent word used to designate them is the word uh, nabi or nabi, uh, which means prophet, used 300 times in the Old Testament. The prophet of the Lord. Uh, one who's been called or appointed to proclaim the message uh, of God himself, God's very message. There's another word that comes up related to the prophets. It's the word uh, rohe or seer. And it speaks of one who perceives things that are not in the realm of natural sight or hearing, which speaks, of course, of the revelatory nature of the prophets. Peter says no prophecy was born out of one's private interpretation, but holy men were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In other words, they, they had the message of God revealed. Thus saith the Lord occurs much, much in the prophets. Uh, the burden of the Lord came upon the prophets. It's a... The burden being the, the oracle that, that God has given them a message that must be declared. Jeremiah says that I, I tried not to speak it. It was like fire shut up in my bones uh, not to declare the word of the Lord. So uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of how we come up with the term. Samuel, you may not know this, Samuel is considered the first prophet chronologically. Let's, let's just uh, look at this cu couple of citations here in the New Testament. Acts 3.24 Acts 13, 20, and then Hebrews eleven thirty two. 32. Look, Acts 3, 24, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel, notice, and those who came after him also proclaimed these days, talking about living in the last days. Uh, Acts 13, 20, all this took about 450 years, and after that he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. So the New Testament revelation, looking back at the Old Testament, is identifying Samuel as, the, as sort of the inaugural prophet. Um, Hebrews 11:32. What more shall I say? This is the this is that hall of the heroes of the faith, chapter 11. For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel and the prophets. All right. So so you have this designation. We we point this out to you when we were going through the historical material, that uh, he was the first to create a school of prophets. Um, presided over them at Ramah. Look at 1 Samuel 19, 20. Then Saul sent messengers to take David, and when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as head over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. So you have this picture here of, of Samuel as being the headmaster, uh, the dean of a school of the prophets. Now, when you would get into this, if you know anything about the prophets, you know that they, they really they had a special imbuement from on high, uh, endowed with special abilities. Uh, they had a moral and spiritual message which, which necessitated, uh, it was grounded in the, in the Mosaic Law, and particularly in the, in, the, uh, in the Ten Commandments. Their lives had to be consistent with their words. If you look at Deuteronomy 18, 18 to 20, it tells us about what a true prophet would speak uh, and that the prophecies must be accurate. Look at Deuteronomy 18, 18 to 20. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will pour my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. Whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. In other words, if You'll have a reckoning with God if you reject the message, the prophets. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. It's very serious. And when you spoke for the Lord, thus saith the Lord, you, you need to be sure he had called you to do that. 
You know, I don't know if, if any of you saw some of the stuff that was circulating around the approach to the eclipse. But there was no shortage of people speaking prophetically about what was going to happen in the light of this. Um, by biblical standards, they should be stoned to death. Uh, the world did not come to an end. Jesus did not return at the end of the eclipse. The quote, so-called rapture did not occur. Uh, Jim Baker, interesting bird, if you keep up with Jim Baker uh, from back years ago, his, uh, his fall uh, and when he was married to Tammy Faye. Uh, I was telling the folks Wednesday night, we talked a little bit about this, that I saw a t-shirt one time. You remember, remember Tammy Faye Baker, who basically could have kept a cosmetic industry afloat on her own? Um, I saw a t-shirt. It was a white t-shirt, and it had all sorts of colored markings all over the front of it. And the caption was, I ran into Tammy Faye Baker at the mall. Uh, well, Jim Baker's back. If, you, if you've been to Branson, you'll know that he's up there. He's got a show up there. And he uh, predicted that the eclipse was a judgment of God upon our nation for having elected and reelected Barack Obama. Well, there's no doubt in my mind that we deserve judgment for that, but I wondered how is that judgment? I did my best. I completely missed the eclipse in this area, except that my daughter came in from a schooling event toward the end of it and had one of those glasses. I looked up and said, well, sure enough, there is an eclipse. Now, I wasn't, I wasn't foolish enough to gaze directly into the sun myself to see if there was one, but I did take my, my smartphone and stuck it out, took a picture of it and looked back and it was, it was a full sun. I mean, it was just as bright as it could be. I don't, I don't know what kind of a judgment that was supposed to be. Two and a half minutes, uh, we had uh, we had some shading, two and a half minutes in the path, there was complete darkness that came and went. False prophets abound today. They take the moniker upon themselves that God has told them to say this. And they ought to drop to their knees and thank God that we live in a day of, which is showing his great patience and long-suffering or they'd have been struck, he would have required it of them, like this passage said. What was the message? Uh, prophecy, by the way, is a twofold. It's foretelling and forthtelling. Foretelling is predictive. That's what a lot of these fellows do. They don't do a whole lot of forthtelling. They, they basically are tied up in predicting what's going to happen. Uh, but, you know, that was not the bulk of the prophet's ministry, if you look in the Old Testament. The primary role was that of forth telling, of, of telling forth the word of the Lord. They needed and received from God spiritual insight as well as foresight. They proclaimed consequences of, of certain attitudes and practices. They drew upon the past for lessons from God's dealings in the past. And they use those as a basis for giving exhortations concerning the present conduct. They were reformers. They spoke of the need of present reforms to, to uh, head off the judgment of God upon them. And so I came across this, and I thought this was really helpful, that the, the prophetic message had four major themes, and I want to put them up on here for you to see. First of all, the prophets exposed the sinful practices of the people. Uh, it required a lot of courage for them to tell the people what they needed to hear. Some of these prophets get thrown in dungeons and in pits for having the courage to speak the truth. They did that rather than succumbing to the temptation of telling them what they wanted to hear. You, you can check it out. You don't find one prophet in the Old Testament who tickled anybody's ears. God's messengers could not compromise their, their harsh treatment of sin as sin, knowing that the only hope for the people was a humble turning to the Lord and an acknowledgement of their guilt. They were like a watchman on the wall. In fact, Isaiah 62 gives this imagery of the prophets being watchmen on the wall, alerting the people 
of coming danger. There was, a, there was the teaching that if, if, the, if the watchman sounded an uncertain sound, if they weren't clear about the revelatory message of God, that the people would be in danger of being overtaken. The messages were very practical. Secondly, the prophets called the people back to the moral, civil, and ceremonial law of God. They continued to bring them back to the standard. They would deviate from it. They were always expected as an Old Testament people to practice the ceremonial law, to be a, a civil society. Not, and I don't mean by that not civil, uncivil. A civil a society ordered by the portion of the law in the Old Testament that taught them how to be a distinct people. The ceremonial law was designed in their worship to keep them a distinct people and to help them anticipate the one who would come to fulfill the ceremonial law. They were urged to trust the Lord with all their hearts. They were reminded that God had a rich purpose for them, which was to, to exist as a people until the, to usher Messiah into the world. That Israel would give the ultimate gift to the world, the Son of God, born of David. But they had to believe and obey in God. Just the fact that they were his people was not enough to keep them from suffering uh, at the hand of God. They warned the people of coming judgment, of a holy God who will condemn the nation if its princes, its priests, its people continue to arrogantly reject God's moral and spiritual principles. They are responsible for their disobedience to their covenant commitment with God. He made a covenant with them. They were taught that God, Yahweh, the covenant God, was, is the sovereign Lord of history, and that the Gentile nations would also be judged if they rebelled against his dominion. The difference is that Israel was sinning against more light. As Paul says in the New Testament, yours is the covenants. <laughs> yours the promises. Fourth, the prophets anticipated the coming Messiah. And, and they, they showed that for, for the anticipation of the Messiah, that history was linear. It was unfolding, moving toward the, the full manifestation of the, of, of, the, uh, of the answer of God for sin. History was headed toward a definite goal. I was telling someone the other day, I heard a preacher say years ago that the time is coming. As, as time unfolds, we move closer to the consummation of the age. He said when, when God will... Um, blow history out like a candle and roll it up like a scroll. It's powerful imagery there when it's done. And it would, it would have a consummation in the Messianic age. They anticipated the Messiah, calling the people to recognize that his, his name would be honored, his voice obeyed by all the people of the earth ultimately. That every knee would bow, every tongue confess the Lordship of Jesus Christ. At that time frame, at the end of the age, do it to their damnation. Biblical prophecy is unique because it's, it's often very clear. There's, we use a fancy word, the perspicuity of Scripture. It speaks of the clarity of Scripture. Biblical prophecy is, is, uh, is very clear. And this specific fulfillment, and we've talked about this before, this, uh, this kind of, uh, for lack of a better description, this rubber band look, prophecies given would have, a, have a, what we call a fairly immediate fulfillment. That's one of the tests of the prophets, did what he say come true, but they would have a, uh, the, the word's proleptic, they would have an ultimate fulfillment very often in something to do with the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. One writer observed that over 300 Old Testament prophecies were precisely fulfilled by Jesus in his first coming. And there are over 400 more that remain to be fulfilled when he comes again. And so Acts 10.43, one of the messages in Acts, says, To him, to Jesus, all the prophets bear witness. That's, the, uh, that's in, in concert with what we read from John 5. They, they speak of me. To him all the prophets bear witness 
that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So in summary about the, the message, the prophetic message is twofold. Condemnation because of the sin of man and consolation or redemption because of the grace of God. Now it's interesting. There was a foretelling aspect, right? There's nobody around today doing that. When you find someone who says he or she is, they're a heretic or, or maybe belong in an institution, but, but they're not sent by God. The fourth telling aspect, however, so though, though no gospel preacher worth his salt would ever take upon himself the mantle of prophet, there is that aspect that continues of the prophetic utterance. It's the telling forth of the message of God. The difference is we don't need to go and hear revelation from God. He has given us revelation, the full, final revelation in the scripture. So condemnation, this helps you remember it, condemnation because of sin, consolation because of grace. That's kind of a summary of what you're going to hear throughout all the prophets. Uh, they did uh, emphasize uh, four time frames. And you'll see. One was their own day. They were speaking to the, to the current situation in which they lived. Things happening, uh, enemies on the horizon, the, the people turning away from God. They spoke of the captivity and the return from captivity. They spoke of the, of the coming of Jesus, of Christ, the, the incarnation. And they spoke of the ushering in of the messianic kingdom. Now, when we read the prophets, if you read them, chronology for them, in other words, getting an, an accurate timeline was not as important in their minds as the events they're dealing with themselves. So sometimes, the reason I say that is when you're reading through them, sometimes these just these four periods I just spelled out, they will blur the distinction in that. It won't be immediately uh, obvious which time period they were addressing. Some events were fulfilled literally. Some were fulfilled partially. Some were yet unfulfilled. They used a lot of uh, symbols and figures of speech. This is particularly true of Ezekiel. Ezekiel would have made a lot of people uncomfortable had he been invited in for a so-called revival meeting in a church. Okay. But in the midst of symbols and figures of speech, they speak to real events. There's, a, there's an interesting diversity and an individuality among the prophets. Talking about the prophets in general now, the major and minor prophets. You go all the way from Isaiah, which, which is considered a very sophisticated address, 66 chapters, to what some have called the, the simplicity of Amos, the uh, not educated. Isaiah knew royalty. Amos did not. Personalities, backgrounds, and interests, and writing styles vary. But you see in the lives of all of them, as we said earlier, this common courage, this common uh, conviction, this, this commitment to tell the truth of God no matter what it might cost them. It'd be good to have a revival of that in the pulpit today. The time frame that they wrote from the, what we call the 9th century prophets all the way to the 5th century, so the 800s to the 400s. And so uh, we'll be seeing those as we look into these more specifically. 17 prophetic books, right? Twelve were pre-exilic, that is, twelve take place before the Jews are carried off into, into exile. Two are during the exile, and three are after the return from exile, post-exilic. So let's, let's spend a few minutes now, before we wrap up, looking at these, that the major prophets. That's what we're going to be beginning uh, next Sunday, Lord willing. There's Isaiah. Now, Isaiah is considered the, I would say this, he's the, he's the book of Romans of the Old Testament, all right? Uh, my Greek professor, Curtis Vaughn, said uh, when we were studying 
uh, Romans in Greek. He said that when you climb Romans, the Romans is your, your, the New Testament. If you consider it a mountain uh, mountain range, you climb Romans and you hit you hit the end of chapter eight, chapter nine, chapter ten, chapter eleven. He said you you're standing on the Mount Everest of, of New Testament revelation, and you can see all the other mountaintops from there. Isaiah is that for the Old Testament. It analyzes the sins of Judah, warns them of God's judgment. That's in, in uh, Isaiah 1 through uh, 39. He speaks of the judgment coming to surrounding nations and then goes to the universal judgment. After he's dealt pointedly and powerfully with coming judgment, he then goes into consolation. You'll remember probably chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort ye my people. It seems to come out of nowhere after what he said in chapters 1, verse 39. Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. And the 40th chapter of Isaiah is, is just so powerful about the, the majesty of God and the mercy of God. Have you not heard? The everlasting Lord cares for his people. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This, he carries the little lambs in his arms. It's the 40th chapter. So you move into this, this uh, wonderful message of consolation. It's within that second portion of Isaiah where you have the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. And throughout it all, remember Yahweh. It just reminds the names of God. Elohim, introduced in Genesis, is, is God, the creator, in a plural form. Let us make man in our image. Yahweh is the covenant name for God. Moses said, whom shall I tell Pharaoh has sent me to him? God said, tell him, I am has sent you. Hayah, the verb of being in Hebrew, the, the, name, the nominal form of that being Yahweh, the covenant God, who was, is, is to come, always has been, always will be. So that's kind of a picture of, of Isaiah, all right? Let's move on to Jeremiah. Uh, in Jeremiah's day, uh, moral decay plummets to, un, uh, to previously unknown depths. And he's called the weeping prophet because he, he looked upon a culture that was in great disarray. We, we ought to be weeping today. I read an article this afternoon. God, I have children in here. That the latest move of the, of the very progressive uh, anti-God LGBTQ XYZ movement uh, is... Uh, normalizing relations between adults and children. Um, and it's big. And it's gaining momentum. Jeremiah lived in a day of spiritually and morally decay. And he warned them of God's judgment coming. He was rejected. He was persecuted. And God finally brought his judgment. Uh, my friend R.F. Gates taught through Jeremiah in a, in a setting we were in, did an overview of it years and years ago. And he pointed out, he said, if you read Jeremiah carefully, what you'll discover is that all the years of his prophesying, there was not evidence of one person who believed him. His entire ministry was by some measurements a failure by human measurements. Not one person believed him. Thrown in prison, wrote a scroll, God told him to write it, was burned. So uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a figure to be pitied because he ministered in a very uh, wicked setting. But we can learn from him too because that's where we live today. That's our culture. 
But in the midst of all that, as you see in all the prophets, by the way, in the, in, in the, in the promise of judgment, the actual action of judgment, there's always the message of, of a new covenant coming. And you find that in Isaiah, uh, pardon me, Jeremiah 31. When he, will, when he will no longer tell his people to embrace, to, to measure up, obey the laws written on stone, he will, himself will write his law on their hearts. He'll take away the stony heart and give them a heart of flesh. So, so that's the, the promise of the new covenant that comes out of Jeremiah. Lamentations is, a, is another, uh, one of, identified as one of these, shorter uh, than the rest of the major prophets. Uh, but it's five lament poems. Uh, and this writer that I found said it's Judah's funeral for the fallen city of Jerusalem. After 40 years of warning, Jeremiah's judgment promises come true. Then you have Ezekiel. Ezekiel ministered in, uh, to the captives in, in Babylon. So this is one of those we call exilic, times of the exile, before and after the fall of Jerusalem. Convincing the people that it was, the city was doomed and that the captivity would not be brief. It, wasn't, it wouldn't be over soon. Then he talked about the, the fate of those who'd come against them. You may or may not remember, God, God raised up Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, to take his people captive. And then, because he called him my servant, Nebuchadnezzar. And then he turned around and punished Nebuchadnezzar for doing it. That's, that's just how sovereign God is. Then the book of Daniel, uh, a lot of visions for the future. Uh, it gives an outline of God's, God's sovereign plan uh, for the Gentile nations. Uh, talks about Israel during a time of, of Gentile domination. And it falls into the arena of apocalyptic literature very much like the book of Revelation. But the, through it all, woven through it all, is that God has a future. I would, I would take it like when you go back to the Garden of Genesis and God comes in to Adam and Eve. Adam, where are you? Why are you hiding? What have you done? And he goes through and he... Adam passes the buck to his wife Ish blames Isha Isha blames the serpent and then God begins to pronounce judgment you will uh, the man will toil the earth bitterly with increasing difficulty the sweat of your brow the woman giving birth will be accompanied with increasing pain. There's going to be pain, but, but increasing pain. Multiply your pain. And then the serpent. Now that's, you look at that, that, those are words of judgment. But in the midst of that, remember I've taught you this, Adam and Eve, she would be called, heard she will give birth in pain. Which told them, and when God said, in the day that you eat thereof, this fruit that I forbid you to eat, you shall surely die, which told them they were not going to be executed judicially by God. So Adam gave her the name he did, because she would be mother of all the living ones. Whether you realize reading through that, that's hope. That's, that's hope in the midst of judgment. And that's what you see in, in Daniel and some of the other prophets. So, so that's what we're going to be taking on in these. It's going to be broken up. But that's what we're going to be taking on in the next uh, a few Sundays before we look uh, at the uh, minor prophets, the smaller prophets, no less important than the major prophets. Okay, now I'll stop right there. Questions?